Hello, everyone. Now's the time to turn the volume up. My name is Mike Reapy, and I'm one of your volunteer organizers this evening. On behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly speaker series, Slugs and Steins, Lectures from UC Santa Cruz. For those who are new, our Slugs and Steins series engages a, UCS, a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in discussion with you, the local community of Silicon Valley and our extended community online. With me tonight is Don, John Madrid, the current president of the UCSC Alumni Association. You'll be seeing John later tonight during Q&A and, and he'll be giving the closing remarks. Uh, David and April have a well-deserved night off tonight. The great physicist Richard Feynman once said, everything is interesting if you go into it deeply enough. If you agree with him, you're one of us. We wanted to feel just like you're at UC Santa Cruz, among the Redwoods, sitting in class, uh, but with drinks. Uh, now I'd like to share with you the UCSC land acknowledgement. The land on which we gather tonight is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe, the Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast today is working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. Finally, before we get started, we'd like to take a poll to get to know our audience and where you're tuning in from this evening. Please take a moment to answer a few quick questions that will pop up on your screen. We'll share the results after we've given everyone a moment to respond. Got some good data coming in. Thanks, everyone. We can see where you're all dialing in from. Uh, Lots of people from Santa Cruz, Bay Area. Wow, 23, six people from outside the United States. That's interesting. Uh, oh, all right. So yeah, thanks. Uh, this should give you an idea of who your neighbors are. Um, we got a lot of couples watching, that's good to know. And uh, I'd say mostly lots of people from the Bay Area, California. Yeah, seven people from uh, outside California. That's great, welcome. That includes my parents, hi mom and dad. I expect you to answer at least, uh, ask at least one question. So you can dismiss that when you're done. Uh, so tonight we raise our steins with game designer, paper terror and assistant professor of art and design, Elizabeth Swenson. She received her MFA in interactive media from the University of Southern California and her BA in classics from Willamette University. Her research is in designing narrative for interactive experiences, system design for playful learning, and experimental tabletop RPG design, uh, and also as part of the UCSC Center for Monster Studies. So it's no coincidence she's talking to us in October. Professor Swenson will take questions at the end of the talk. Uh, if you have an urgent question, uh, or if you have a question for her, please type it into Zoom's Q&A box below. Uh, uh, John and I will be reading the questions at the end. You don't need to wait until the last minute uh, to ask your question. You can type it at any time. Uh, if you do see someone else's question that you like, you can upvote it and we'll ask those questions sooner. So do us a favor, uh, help John and I out by upvoting a lot of questions. The talk this evening is being recorded. In a day or two, you'll be able to find it on the UCSC Arts Lectures and Entertainment YouTube channel, and you'll get a thank you email from us with the link later. Okay, uh, does everyone have their steins? Great, I've got your slug, Professor Elizabeth Swenson. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Swenson. I use she, her pronouns. And just like with my students, you can call me Elizabeth or Professor Swenson, I answer to it all. Today, we'll be talking about how to recognize values in games through game design. A little bit of a lesson I'm teaching my first year students right now. Of course, the content's a little different for this audience, but it's really a joy to share with the larger community, including some of our alumni. I don't think I'll be talking about my background in classics, but if you wanna ask questions about Marshall's epigrams in uh, Imperial Rome, I translated a lot of them before I realized I could get a graduate degree in the thing I actually loved, which was video games. No shade to the classics, I love them too, but this is the career that I was meant to do. Speaking of that, let me start my slides. I'm getting in full, 
one second. I always want to make sure I have my sound on correctly. We should be in the right place now. You'd think we'd have a lot of practice after teaching for several years distanced in the pandemic, uh, but every once in a while, I like to pretend that didn't happen and forget it conveniently. Sending of the Zoom interface interfering with my slides. Hopefully not. I'm going to move forward if it isn't. So I'm in a department called performance play and design, a sort of new uh, child, a merger between art and design, games and playable media, and theater arts uh, at UC Santa Cruz, all in the arts division. Games and theaters might seem like unusual friends, but for us, it's pretty natural. We have a lot of research interests that are alike, and we're all very interested in making experiences with lots of people for an audience a narrative through line, if you will. This is me, about age eight, uh, when I realized that the second controller uh, on a, the original Nintendo while playing Duck Hunt could indeed control the duck. The internet rumors are true, and it was true back then. I've always had a love of games and just had to overcome the typical skepticism of my family when I spent wanted to spend a lot of my time doing them. Uh, I had a no screen until homework is done rule and also a no video game consoles in the house rule. This was at my grandparents' house. I don't know why my grandfather had a Nintendo. Supposedly he played fighter pilot games on it, but I think it was just for us, the grandkids. However, when I was about eight years old, I told my parents not to pay me my $2 a week allowance for a year so I could afford a Game Gear. And then a long and brutal fight with my parents on how many games I could play per week would continue for the rest of my childhood. Some of you might find this a familiar discussion if you have children yourself. Uh, I now make my living doing it. So you never know, it might come full circle for uh, your kids or the young ones in your lives. I'm a game designer, and as you will see in these slides, I am not a graphic designer. I've had to give a couple of lectures on typography. They're very funny. Um, it is not my strong suit, and my handwriting doesn't suggest that I'm much of a visual artist for someone who's in the arts division. A game designer is interested in the experience of playing something interactive. We set experience goals, how we want the player to feel, what we want the player to do, what the rules and procedures of the interaction will be. I, am, I often talk about game design in terms of hosting a really good party. Um, there are a number of lovely books about the art of hosting or the art of gathering is a title you may have heard before. Game designers share a lot of the similar sort of mm, social know-how and controlling for uncertainty, setting helpful rules and boundaries and knowing when to break them. Because I'm a game designer and not uh, necessarily always a game developer in the software sense, I'm medium agnostic. I'm one of those people who will define a game about as broadly as one might be able to. So because any sort of program or platform can be a game to me, some of the games that I design are what you might expect, 3D virtual or digital experiences. This is Life Underground made at the USC Game Innovation Lab. Uh, I was one of the designers on this project when I worked on the research side of things. This is about studying extremophiles deep underground in an environment modeled after research being done two miles below the surface in a decommissioned gold mine in I think South Dakota. Fascinating stuff. Or I might tear up a bunch of construction paper. That paper terror is a reference to one of my favorite projects that I did in graduate school called The Witch, where for some reason I thought I would make all my assets out of paper, laboriously scan them and sort of trace them out in Photoshop to become layers in a two-dimensional two digital game. But I also make physical games, whether that's a board or card game, or as you heard, experimental tabletop RPG. Uh, sometimes still in the educational field, 
uh, a lot of my early research was in how we can think about metacognitive outcomes in learning, how we get people to think about how they're learning something, whether that's about extremophiles and becoming a scientist or being inspired by STEAM fields in middle school, or this game, Application Crunch, also made in the Game Innovation Lab at USC, uh, which is about the meta strategy of how to get into college. If no one in your family has ever gotten into college, how do you learn the unspoken rules about which extracurriculars and how much count? What does it mean to be good at many things or an expert in one thing? What does an application to a scholarship look like? What questions should you, should you be asking yourself and your peers to prepare you for a really competitive landscape? But sometimes I make people wear boats on their head and wander in the dark, pretending to find lighthouses. All of these are games to me, whether they're played in a physical space with a physical body, played in our minds or socially in a party space or played with digital tools and digital screens. I'll talk about what this talk is about. That'll be most of this evening. But before I do, I wanna just say a couple of things this talk is not about when we're talking about values and games. I don't wanna talk about whether or not games have a value in society. There have been plenty of articles written about that. Um, but in my mind, that argument is settled. I see games as one of many art forms. They can be as fantastical or as crass as a blockbuster summer thriller film. They can be as meditative and dense or philosophically sort of mind bending as some of your favorite books. Uh, they can be transformative, they can be arresting and they can be horrifying. Uh, just like any other art form that we have, whether we lean a little more artistic or a little more commercial. And I like them all. I'm playing a lot of Baldur's Gate 3 in my spare time right now. That is a big blockbuster game that's out. I love a turn-based tactic game. If you want to talk XCOM in your questions, we can talk about that, but I think you might have other questions for me. This talk is not about should I let my child play video games. I do answer that question a lot, mostly for my own relatives. Uh, I will answer it shortly here because it's not what this talk is about. I would say treat a video game or even a board game as you would treat a movie. If you suspect that the content is something that might challenge uh, the development of the young people in your life, then maybe watch it slash play it with them in the way that you would uh, a film with more mature themes or content. Okay. Before I begin, I am a nerd and sometimes I let my vocabulary escape me. I use terms within a game designer's vernacular and sometimes familiar terms that we use differently in game design than someone in a different field might use. So I'm gonna talk about a few of those words uh, briefly. And this is the great, uh, a great category of question if you have a question in the middle of the talk um, that some of our fine folks here might keep an eye out for. If there's a vocabulary question or clarification, I am happy to be interrupted to answer it because sometimes they'll sneak in. It's hard for us academics to avoid our jargon. I'm lucky that I'm in a fairly popular media industry slash field. Uh, so there are fewer of them. You're going to get fewer equations from me today, but you will get one, perhaps. Uh, but I still do use some crunchy, nerdy words because I'm that kind of person. Here are three things I talk about a lot as a game designer. I talk about mechanics, I talk about systems, and I talk about player experience. There are so many wonderful frameworks to study games by. You can read papers and books by scholars and artists that quantify what games are. Um, they use different terms to describe them, but most of them fall into some sort of triad, sometimes with different names that sort of cover these three areas. When I'm talking about mechanics, at the most simple level, I'm talking about the verbs a player gets to use in a game or the verbs a system gets to enact in response to uh, or around the player. 
But in a number of definitions of that word, I'm not just talking about the rules or procedures of a play experience. I'm talking about the physical landscape, the play space. Where is it played? How many players are there? What are the dynamics between those players? Is this teams? Are we all working together against the rules or against gravity uh, in the case of many sports? <laughs> uh, are we thinking about what materials we use, uh, what time of day are we playing, all of those can sometimes be squished into this term mechanics. But most often when I talk about mechanics today, I'll use a more familiar definition talking about the rules, procedures, the verbs of play. When I talk about systems, I'm talking about the dynamics of play, sometimes described as the game in motion or what happens when the players begin enacting the mechanics or the rules and procedures. These are the relationships, the input and output of the games. Sometimes we might even call these emergent strategies, things we might not even discover at first glance from reading rules that reveal themselves through play. And this is where the topic of today sort of sneaks in because it's often the relationship between the mechanics and the systems that they generate that we can read and interpret the value of a game, or I should say the values of a game, the values that a game supports, uh, the values that a game professes. Often in digesting games, we talk about the player experience in a number of different ways in various frameworks, we might talk about that experience in terms of the dramatics of a system, elements of challenge, of narrative, of role-playing, but sometimes we might talk about categories of engagement, um, like competition or relaxation. We might talk about it in emotional words. Uh, this is a game about regret you'll find that my taste tends to lean towards sad games. I promise those aren't the only games that I love. But when I present my students with a challenge, I often ask them to complicate fun. Why do we watch tragedies? And what does it mean to make a game that is a tragedy? As much as this might otherwise be abstract, <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't give some examples about how mechanics and systems can express values. Before I do, I might give you something to think about, uh, which has to do with mechanics. I often try to talk my students through the expressive possibilities in common mechanics. There's a type of game called a platformer where one spends quite a bit of time running and jumping. And I talk about the expressive potential of running and jumping. What kind of story does running and jumping tell? There can be a temptation to make, um, especially in uh, indie spheres, games about a number of very complicated real life topics with the expressive sort of verbs of jumping and running. And it's not inappropriate to do so. One sort of ties into a nostalgia in games when thinking of the old arcade cabinets that we grew up with. But it's always worth stopping to think when one is making a game, why is jumping essential to tell this story? Why is moving essential to tell this story? What about this story is about motion? I will also say I might use the word story a lot but in games, we have multiple kinds of stories. We have narratives, as you might expect, with beginnings, middles, and ends, or poetical uh, sort of sonnets of games, things that are impressionistic, but give sense of, senses of character or place or tone. But story is also the player's story, the feeling of their own arc of overcoming challenge or mystery while playing. So some games might not have a compelling written narrative, but still have a compelling player narrative around uh, chance or challenge or cooperation or companionship. One way I talk about the responsibility of a designer when coming up with values that a mechanic or a system might have is descri to describe games as worlds in which, uh, this is an image, thank you Wikipedia, your article on tag um, from a, a German text about youth play, youth games. Uh, you could say that tag is a world in which we chase and hit our friends. 
Now, everyday life, um, we might chase and hit our friends, but they might think poorly of us when we do. But when we engage in the game of tag, we're creating um, what is often sort of thought of as this um, magical boundary uh, where we accept the rules of a new world. Sometimes it is more or less penetrable. Sometimes we might still feel bad when we stop playing tag about something someone did in the game. But at the very basic level, we're accepting a premise, a world in which uh, hitting our friends and chasing them is acceptable. Now, if you told someone the rules of tag, because it is a game often taught or passed on from one person to another, we would probably wouldn't spend a great deal of time saying, uh, what is a tag? What is that touch? How much velocity is acceptable? Where can it be performed on the body? We sort of let social cues and rules sneak into the game of tag. We rely on social expectations when we play a game like that. And yet we're creating a slightly different world. In a game like Fallout 3, we're creating a world in which people are made up of predetermined stats. Human existence is summarized in as we see here in the Pip Boy sort of status screen, strength, perception, endurance, charisma, intelligence, agility, and luck. That is what a person is. This is what we value in a person, you might say. This is certainly what the game judges a person on, in addition to a number of hand-eye coordination skills, uh, like not falling off the edge of the map. I think there's falling damage in Fallout. I could be misremembering that. It's been well, since 2008, since I played that game. Another thing that you might see as an obvious jump to thinking about the values of games are games that express morality. In games like Fallout, there is a karma system. You get karma points for doing actions in the game, whether it's rescuing an outpost uh, or killing an innocent, your karma score goes up and down. The results of one's karma status in a game like this might change the way a character treats you in this game. But you'll find that across especially more popular large budget games, when we think about ethics or morality as it is measured and displayed to the player, it's usually on a single axis and that axis is usually something like good and evil. Very few games recognize a player who makes both kinds of choices, although certainly many of them too. They just maybe don't publish, publicize those middle grounds quite as well as the games that give you devil horns when you've made many evil choices or a halo when you've made many good choices. Uh, an interesting nod to a very Judeo-Christian approach to good and evil. But each game sort of gives away something about what they value of good and evil by telling us what gives us those points. What is, what is evil and what is good in a world in which you are this character. So a world in which saving an outpost is a good action and you can still be a good character while killing thousands of NPCs that are coded in the game as evil. It's an interesting interpretation and not a new one. You'll see many talks and conversations around narrative dissonance of, for example, in the recent um, Laura Croft remake games, this gutting cutscene as Laura kills the first person uh, in that entire game and within that narrative, within her entire life, she's brought to tears, gagging and retching in the horror that she's done. And in the next scene, uh, you as a player, because games benefit from repetition, so we learn how to do things and get better at them, you kill like 30 people in two minutes and you don't get a, a cutscene about that. So a world in which we have some narrative dissonance is also a conversation we have in a lot of game circles. Or we might imagine a game that doesn't exist. This is a photo of some D&D &D minis in front of a lovely view in Germany from this summer. But it was a rainy day. And we can imagine a game where you are a traveler and there is a rain system. And when it rains, your character gets wet. And when they get wet, they grow weak. And when they grow weak, they might get sick. 
If that is all that rain does within the rules of a game, that would be a world in which rain is bad. In our world, rain can be good, it can be bad, it's part of a complicated climate system. We need water, that's important, too much rain is a bad thing. But in the abstraction and simplification that we sometimes see in games, uh, we can create very strong value associations. You can certainly make a game that has a value of rain being bad. I wanna share a, a more full example, and I'm sorry that in my discipline, it is really painful to show games when I should be making you play games. Uh, and if uh, Slugzenstein invites me back uh, to an in-person event, we'll be sure to play some games. Uh, it's like uh, there's some lovely uh, quote that I'm going to butcher because I don't remember who it's from. No, I'm not even gonna go there, but it'd be like, you know what it's like to talk about cinema. It's not the same as going to see a movie. Or if you were to pantomime a book, it's not gonna be the same as reading it. Talking about a game is not gonna be the same as playing it. But this is a very simple game. So I'm hoping that in my description, you'll be able to get the gist of how a little bit of unintended math in a German children's board game leads to an unintended value embedded in its system. So this is a game called Up the River. It was produced in 1988. It is currently out of print. It was briefly replaced by a game that's identical um, systemically in its rules and procedures, but themed towards space. I believe that's called Race Through Space. But that too is now out of uh, print. So me talking about it now might be your only chance to see it, unless you read Tracy Fullerton's book, Game Design Workshop. Uh, Tracy Fullerton was one of my professors when I was studying games in graduate school, and I taught at her institution. So this example comes from sort of their line of teaching game design. So Up the River is a children's board game where players race to move their ships before the current takes them away. This is the part where I read slides, my least favorite part of anything, so forgive me. But to get the math out, it's nice to be precise. Each player gets three boats, and there is a single six-sided die. Uh, and on one's turn, you roll the die and get to move one boat up the river. The objective is to tie up your boat at the dock at the end of the river. And the dock has these little tie-up posts that start at 12 points and go down sequentially by one until you reach one point. The player with the highest score at the end of the game wins. Pretty simple so far, a little dice race game. There are only two special tiles. One is the sandbar. This interrupts movement. If you are on the tile before the sandbar and roll a five, you can only, sorry, that's my alarm. You can only move your boat up until you reach the sandbar, even if the die would normally let you roll further. On a subsequent turn, you can move the boat as normal. If a player lands exactly on that wave token, they get to move forward three additional spaces. So far, this is a pretty typical dice race game designed for the most part to teach children simple math and how to take turns, not typically crunchy stuff of interest to adults. Now there are numbers on five sides of the six-sided die, one through five. If players roll a six, and I believe as the game was packaged, there's a symbol on it instead of a six, they have a choice between uh, a good wind or an ill wind. If you roll, if you choose to take the good wind to action, you move one of your boats to join your next nearest boat as it's progressing towards your goal. So you can't take your boat in last place and move it up to your boat in first place but you move the last place boat to second or the second place boat to first. Ill wind is the reverse for your opponents. You can move one of your opponent's boats back to join their next furthest back boat. If both their boats are at the start, other than the first that's raced ahead, it really can sink their game and probably make some players of this age cry. This is the starting board of the game. 
And on this board, uh, you can see a few things. One, that the spaces you can land on can move. That's an interesting affordance of the pieces. It suggests that I maybe haven't told you all the rules and that would be true. And it otherwise would make sense. That sandbar begins behind the boats. How would you ever run into it? Well, that's because the board moves. You're on a river. After every player has taken a turn, the river shifts back one tile. So that sandbar that begins behind the boats goes up to the top of the board, uh, creating a bit of a what we might call a rubber banding effect, the kind of action you see in a game like Mario Kart that stops someone from winning, uh, from winning even more, like the blue shell uh, that targets the first place player, or a number of other uh, mechanics like the fact that it is easier to aim ahead of you than it is to aim behind you generally. You want to punch up in Mario Kart. So this effective, this sort of mechanic, this procedure creates a sort of conveyor belt uh, feeling to the game. There's constant pressure moving all the boats backwards away from their goal. Now, if in the course of play and when the moment the tile must move, if there are boats on it, they fall off the waterfall and are out of the game. Very sad. I think within the narrative of this game, they're intended to be toy boats uh, for a children's game. If you imagine there are people on them, it becomes quite gory quite fast. So just to reiterate, this is a game with multiple moving tiles. Each player has three boats. There's a six-sided die, but that number six is a little tricky because if you move an opponent's boat, you get no movement yourself. Uh, if you move your own boats, it's in an unpredictable sort of way. So in analyzing the systems of this game, I might oversimplify it. I might say you have three boats and you have a die that can roll a number between one and five, just to sort of study it a little bit. This is the math. If you were my students, I would make you answer this question. Uh, assuming a five-sided die with outcomes of one, two, three, four, and five, what is the average roll? Now, I know we have some STEM grads here, so I promise uh, this is the only equation you will see, but we can also kind of intuit that the average roll is three. This is important for figuring out the values, I promise. Bear with me. So in this game, you have three ships. One ship of yours will gain on average three spaces per turn, but each ship loses a space per turn as the river moves. So because you're moving them one at a time, after three turns, all sh three ships will have gained three spaces if you move each one of them, the average number of spaces. But because of the river's effect, after three turns, all three ships lose three spaces. So one way to ask what a value of a system is, is to ask if there's a dominant strategy or an optimal way to play the game. In this case, if you play the game the way the narrative intends, moving all your ships towards victory. And if you get average outcomes on your rolls, your net movement is zero. You make no progress. Now, again, this is probably part of the designer's intent. Uh, this is a game about taking turns. This is a game for children to learn counting and uh, the feeling of winning and losing. And you look at this game and it seems like it's going to end quickly. This will occupy small children for hours because of the net zero movement. It's quite insidious. The designers are brilliant. But because of that, there is an optimal way to play the game. Because up the river, as a result of this net zero movement, has a value of sacrifice. I don't think the designers would describe it that way, but the optimal way to play the game is to not move one of your ships, to only move two of them. The optimal way to play the game is to let a ship fail. That's wild to me the first time that I played this game and struggled with it as an adult, uh, how long it took uh, before we looked at the math in the face and realized the way to play was to let one go. This is a little bit grim. Thanks Ravensburger for this board game. 
Uh, but if you find yourself wondering about a point of view in a game designed for adults, or perhaps a not game system you encounter in your everyday life, it's worth examining what the optimal strategy is and what that says about this is a world in which. This is a world in which, up the river, it is better to have two succeed and one fail than everyone stay afloat. Pretty cynical if you ask me. Here are some other interesting examples. Uh, again, not as perhaps cutting as looking at Up the River. Love Letter is a card game developed in 2012 uh, that I would say has the value of secrecy and bluffing. Despite the narrative being about del delivering a love letter to a princess, there's no romance in this game at all. This game is instead about the values the courtiers must have to gain access to the princess. It's not a dissonant value at all. It's just a different approach and something that has a more romantic veneer. I find that a really fun choice and a way for students to examine what if this game was about romance? What are the systems of romance? Is it weird to systematize romance? Or you might look in the indie scene. Uh, this is a much lauded game despite its basic shapes and graphics. This is Lim by Merit Kopas. In this game, you can navigate in two dimensions through a maze. You are a cube that cycles in many brilliant colors. The only other button you have uh, is an important survival tactic because as you approach other cubes that share a stable color, they will slam their forms into you violently. They will not let you pass. The only way to move through this space is to hold down a button that turns your color into theirs. While you're holding that button, the camera zooms in on your little cube character and begins to shake as if to show the violence you're doing upon yourself by conforming as opposed to the violence done by others if you do not. One of my favorite things about this game, because it was made uh, in uh, an engine not initially designed for games, I believe it was made in Flash, uh, an action script, uh, the physics can get irregular. Sometimes the cubes attack you so violently you get knocked out of the maze entirely, where you could stay your rotating rainbow character unassaulted for the remainder of play. There's no way to end the game in that case, but it's sort of beautiful in its own right. But this game, at its simplest level, says something about the value, the virtue, and the consequence of passing. It's certainly read through a number of queer lenses in the game community. Sometimes games take an expectation one might have for the idea of play and pivots it in some way. That Dragon Cancer is an autobiographical game by the couple who designed it describing the process of loving and losing one of their ch infant children to cancer. Not exactly what you would expect out of a video game or many people who have not had the chance to explore the breadth of the medium. Uh, this is a, a gutting game to play. It has beautiful moments, but it takes something we might take for granted in game design, which is the ability to make choices and to take action and removes it from us. We have the agency to explore this life and this experience, but we don't have the agency to win. We cannot change the outcome of this game. And it's through that lack of agency that we might be able to engage with the tougher subject matter. Or we might have a game like Papers, Please that gives us agency, but not as much agency as we would like. I'd love to just, because talking about games hurts my soul deeply. I'm at least gonna show you some moving images of games. I'd love to show you the trailer from Papers, Please by Lucas Pope. I will say there is a content warning in this about two minute clip for some light pixelated nudity. So if you have some uh, littles or if that's content you aren't wanting to engage with, uh, go get a refill your drink and come back in about two minutes.
itself described here as a dystopian document thriller. It was not released in the 80s as the trailer pretends. It was released in 2013, set in a fictional nation. You play as a border guard uh, of a border that has recently opened for the first time in years. You must check people's passports and search for discrepancies in an increasingly kind of Kafka-esque a uh, pile of rules, regulations, and uh, new documents required by your government. Meanwhile, the people who come up to your booth are telling you their stories. Some of their stories are simple. Some of them are extremely complex. But the only agency you have outside of sorting through the documents that they give you and the rule books you are provided in an intentionally awkward way with mouse controls for the most part uh, is to approve or deny their passport and their entry into your country. The consequences of making errors is in a little side game at the end of every night, you must pay your bills and you are docked pay for every passport you incorrectly mark. Uh, whether you did not didn't notice a typo in a name or that they have the wrong issuing city for the country that they're coming from, remembering that these are all fake countries or that their apparent gender doesn't match uh, in a sort of hideously painful part of the game. Uh, there is a moment where people will tell you that they are in danger and you can choose to make errors on purpose in people's failure. But the more errors you make, you will not be able to pay for things for your own family. So it is an exercise in limited agency to express value. It teaches you a little bit of potential dissonance and dissidence, depending on how you choose to play, whether you're going to help people who come to your door, uh, approve folks who uh, don't quite meet the standards of the border guard position, or whether you deny folks that you suspect uh, are meaning ill to other characters that you encounter. By limiting your power and also burying yourself in the tension of busy work, uh, Papers, Please asks you to make uh, moral decisions under unusual circumstance. Lucas Pope doesn't describe this as an educational game, but you might imagine, given uh, many current political discourses, this game is used as a conversation around uh, borders and terrorism. If you're looking for a book club game to play, uh, Papers, Please is worth the conversation. There is a way to turn off the pixelated nudity in the settings. There's not a way to turn off pixelated violence. We're not watching it again. So as we're rounding out what I think is, ah uh, yes, most of my talk time, I want to talk about some skills for looking for the values in a playful system and a game you might encounter, whether it's for your own entertainment or someone you love. But honestly, these are very similar rules for looking for values in not so playful systems. Excuse me. First, as a game designer, I ask myself some early questions. Who is the designer of the system? Designers have points of view. Uh, while we sometimes make unintentional choices or intention or choices that are um, not as important perhaps to the target audience, like this sacrifice element of up the river that I don't believe is an artistic choice in this case, but instead um, a way to expand the playtime uh, of a game to in order to enforce some of the behaviors the designer is interested in. If I know who designed the system, I have some ideas about what other things they've designed and where they might be coming from. I ask myself who the intended audience of the system is. I'm not always the intended audience for a system that I'm engaging with, whether it's playful or not. And I also often ask who benefits from the system, who benefits from the existence of this art object or real world interactive system. Then I need to pay attention to some details. What is supported by the system and what is not supported by the system? What is technically allowed and what is absolutely not allowed? 
Most games and 3D environments with collision physics systems have rules like you can't walk through walls. Um, but sometimes you actually can. Speedrunning is a very popular media form in which we uh, take advantages of glitches uh, and what you might think of as cheats uh, in order to bypass some of these. But in general, I'm interested in what is actually allowed and what is actually not allowed because it might be different than rules as written. Similarly, what is actively encouraged by the system and what is discouraged by the system? Is it a game that says you can choose to cooperate if you want, but there's an enforced scarcity driving us away from that cooperation? Then I might say the value of that game is competition, even if the rules say you can engage in it in multiple ways. Briefly, I'll talk about how this might affect my own practice. I'm not a perfect game designer, nor will I likely ever be. Um, but I do like to push sometimes on the edges of some common preconceptions about games or boundaries that we see in play uh, and try to direct them towards different values. I mentioned this old gem of a grad school project. This was my attempt at making a game that had a judgment system that wasn't good or evil. This is a game called The Witch. It's not currently available to you, I'm afraid. It was made in action script for the iPad One back when Apple products allowed for flash games, a magical short window of time. But in this game, you as a little girl putting on her grandmother's cloak, you've been labeled a witch and you need to run an errand for her. As you talk to other characters, they. They have dialogue bubbles. They drop words they use. You can choose to attach them to yourself or not, and the characters will treat you differently. The game is paying attention to the choices and interactions you make, but rather than give you good or evil feedback, it's collecting how much of a busybody you are. How active are you in the lives of others, or how passive are you as you move through the world? Are you engaged or disengaged? And the game gives you feedback both around that and how much you choose your identity to fit into the society you found yourself in. It's not trying to tell you that that's good or bad, but influenced no doubt by Lim, it's also talking about the toll one takes in shaping your personality to solve a puzzle. This is one of my more controversial learning games, as in there wasn't a controversy, but potentially controversial in the values of its system. This was a game developed at the USC Game Innovation Lab with funding from Microsoft Research. Microsoft Research was interested in card games about the causes of World War I, and we developed a two-sided card game, two separate games on different sizes for class, sides for classroom. This side was a game called Fact Fuse. You'll notice that the cards have two things on them, verbs and nouns uh, broadly or concepts, often countries, sometimes treaties. And this game was played like a very uh, common game also developed in the 80s called Set, where a number of cards are laid out on the table. The first person who can link three cards together that they see and yell fact uh, gets a point if they can convince the rest of the table that the fact is true. In this case, you see someone has lined up, Germany attacked Belgium. That is a fact, that did happen. But one thing we wanted to do with this game was not just test students on their facts and not just show them the danger of a convincing argument overcoming actual fact, which is an emergent dynamic of this game that we made sure teachers were aware of. We were interested in the danger of charisma overcoming truth, it is in this game. It's something you need to talk about when you play it. It's a fascinating artifact of it, in my opinion. What we were also interested is the powers of words in describing history. You'll notice that attacked is a pretty clear word, but if you hunt around in our deck, you'll find a lot of words like favored, influenced. And if I pick out Germany influenced Belgium, in World War I. Yes, it is technically true, but is it usefully true? What is a more accurate way to describe that relationship? So this is a way to help middle schoolers debate the power of language. Uh, and in doing so, 
uh, perhaps finding out more about their classmates than about World War I history. Lastly is the game I'm working on right now. This is with uh, Associate Professor Nicole Feldel in Earth and Planetary Sciences, an outreach game for a middle school or high school audience based on her research in climate feedback systems. I would say that in addition to the nerdy stuff here, a climate run model running in the back end of a game, which thrilling, like I said, I'm a nerd. Every time I make a learning game, I get to learn new things. But with Warmer, one of the challenges we had around values was to overcome uh, some pretty depressing statistics, not just about our warming world, but about how people think about our warm, warming world. There are a number of surveys given each year about you know, how much people believe in climate change, and thankfully that number keeps going up. Uh, but there is a distance between two very important numbers. Can we affect climate change? versus will we affect climate change? Last time I checked, I haven't looked at the recent year's data, but when we made this, more people believed we as humanity could mitigate climate change than believed we would mitigate climate change. And so in making a game for young people about climate change, how do you bring up these stark facts about how our world is changing without disillusioning our next generations about our willingness or ability to do so. So I'm still thinking about the values of systems, how we tell the truth or tell our perspective as long as we're transparent about it uh, through the mechanics and systems that we generate. The last bit of research that sneaks into here is related to an event that's happening in town, uh, the Festival of Monsters, uh, Friday through Sunday. Friday is the public event. So if you happen to live in the area and wanna hang out at the Ma, you can find out more about what we're doing. But we're looking at the criticality of monsters in all forms of media. For me in games, I like to think about why we scare and what about something is scary and how does that tease out our cultural biases and fears? Can we rethink monstrosity? What's actually monstrous in our day-to-day -day lives rather than uh, the tropes around monstrosity in games like Dungeons and Dragons? So if you wanna talk with me about monsters, come hang out at the Festival of Monsters this weekend. I think we have a little bit of time for questions and I'm gonna get out of my slides. Great. Well, thank you very much, Professor uh, Swenson, for that fascinating uh, talk. Um, gaming was not uh, an option uh, to study when I was a student at UC Santa Cruz, so uh, <laughs> students are definitely fortunate. Um, I have a question to kick it off for you. Um, how would you say the gaming industry has changed most over the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years? Gosh. I mean, it's changed on so many different axes, sort of not unrelated to this topic. I'll kind of get to there, but the tools have become more and more accessible. Uh, you today, audience member, could find a tool without the ability to program that would let you make an interactive digital game. And communities online are encouraging people to mod and design their own board and card games for their own sort of play at home. And because we have more and more people with these tools that are a little bit more accessible and certainly a lot cheaper than they used to be in terms of hardware demands or software cost, we get more people expressing themselves with games. As a result of that, we're seeing some of that expression sort of uh, trickle up to the larger game industry. I think you'll see more and more games now exploring more complicated topics. They don't always you know, land it perfectly, but what medium does, it's the same reason that uh, blockbuster movies like Barbie can be an interesting conversation around feminism and the role of women, 
but they aren't going to be able to cover everything. Barbie's looking at a large audience uh, and what we might call big games or AAA games uh, similarly is, is there. But because the tools are easier, people can get started sooner. There weren't a lot of undergrad game programs when I was coming up to, hence the classics. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. And this is a reminder to the audience. Um, now uh, is the time for, for you to join the talk. So, uh, you know, give us your best questions in the Q&A box and, and look through other people's questions and upvote them and, and help us decide what order to ask them in. So, yeah, if you don't ask questions, I'll just talk about D&D for the rest of this time, which might entertain some of you, but it won't entertain most of you. Sorry. <laughs> well, luckily, my next question was about D&D, &D, but we have some questions coming in from the audience. Incredible. Um, for first question from uh, from uh, Jillian, um, and maybe you need to put this question into context for a little bit here. Uh, she talk or describes herself as a as a girl game geek. Um, why why does Europe and Germany in particular have such a hold on gaming? Why isn't there a game of the year from Africa, for example? So, put that in context for us first. Absolutely. That's a really fascinating question. And I wish I were the board game historian of your dreams. And I'm just not. I know some things about game development in Germany post World War II, but I feel like I'm going to butcher them. So I'm actually going to direct you to a colleague, Nathan Altheis in computational media and engineering has studied a number of board games out of Japan, among other places. There are huge board game libraries coming from all over the world, but that's a really good question about what is valued and translated and brought to market here. So uh, I wouldn't give up hope on those games existing. Uh, you just might uh, encourage larger markets that we care about artists and designers from all over the world. And unfortunately, um, the market isn't bearing that out right now. I think there is the will and we will get there, but uh, there's still quite a bit of, there isn't a lot of diversity, I will say, in either uh, Western video games or in Western board game companies. As the companies become more diverse, uh, we might have a more global perspective. That's the most politic way I can speak about that. But the games are there. And if you're interested in games out of Japan and a completely different tradition of board game forms, Nathan Altais is a fun professor to talk to. And his whole collection of games in his office, like this is only some of mine, his office is full and he's leading student teams in translating those games from Japanese into English. Great, thank you. Mm. Uh, the next question we have is from Shelly. And the question is, can you comment on civilization or games like it that seem to have struggled with their moral messaging over time? Oh, this is a, a classic conundrum in games, especially uh, 4X games, uh, of which one of the X's is exterminate. Uh, there's still a lot of colonization as a core struggle in games and games like civilization have multiple win conditions, including science and culture. Um, I have not gone so deep into Civ that it wasn't my game of choice. Um, but I will say there are people thinking about anti-colonial games. Uh, more and more designers are thinking of flipping the script a little bit on that. And feel free to reach out to me via email if you want a list of anti-colonial games. The first one that comes to mind is a tabletop RPG called Dog Eat Dog. This is a game about colonization specifically in the Pacific, but you can play it to your heart's content in a fantasy setting of your choice. The first rule the designer notes, this might be apocryphal, but I believe I heard him give a talk about this. The first rule of the game is the most ignored. The first rule of the game is the player with the most money will play the colonizing force. To get a bunch of especially Americans to talk about how much money they have is like pulling teeth. And it's essential to start a conversation in an anti-colonial game. But I can give you a longer list if you wanna reach out to my UCSC contact list. 
Okay, uh, next question from, from Rohit. Also, we probably have to put this in, in context. He sure. starts out, is TurboTax a game whose morality might be worth interrogating, right? What other frames do students bring to the discussion where they look at systems of rules like law and game theory and infer implied moral hierarchies? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, I have yet to have a student give me a game analysis of TurboTax, but now I want it desperately. I do encourage students to apply game design thinking to real world systems, especially designed systems. Um, we talk a lot about, um, you know, you might think about educational systems. We have our own bureaucracies in the educational system. We might interrogate uh, how we get access to resources, who succeeds in traditional uh, academia versus who doesn't and why. What are the sort of positive and negative feedback loops of those systems to think about them in a more mathematical term. We just taught those terms today. This is right on topic for intro game design. I love it. Um, sometimes when I introduce game design, I will say that um, because my students aren't all game designers, they're all interested in games, but some of them want to be game artists or game programmers or producers or audio engineers or professional party planners, reality TV show, uh, sort of game mechanics, sort of designers rather than some other forms. But I say study game design is always healthy. Excuse me, I had some barbecue and it's not agreeing with me. I encourage people to study game design because we are surrounded by design systems, even in the mostly banal or sense that are acting on us all the time. Uh, systems that are enforcing behaviors that benefit others and we have to decide if they also benefit us. I remember one of my early environment design professors describing the design of grocery stores, thinking about what are the foods that tend to spoil fastest, that perhaps in a more traditional mindset are bought most often, things like eggs, milk, and meat. Why are they the furthest from the door? We know we can put refrigerated systems in the middle of a grocery store. We have those ice cream aisles we walk through to get to the milk, eggs, and meat for those of us who eat uh, animal products, at least. We put things at the back of the store for a number of reasons, some of them legitimate, but mostly because they want us to see everything before we get the thing we actually want to buy. Uh, we're Environment design, like game design, is trying to convince us of things. Uh, we might not think of the values of buying things we don't need as a value, but spaces certainly influ influence us uh, through design. Uh, so TurboTax, I would love to see an analysis of it. It's worthy of analysis. I won't be able to do it for you here, uh, but it's a great way to think about game design. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, next question we have is from Nathan. And it says, are you willing to say a bit more about monsters? Hmm. If monster is that which cannot be reasoned with and is irrecoverably bent on harm, then does monster remain a useful category, even if the skin of the monsters changes with the fashion of the current era? Naturally, the use of specific skins to teach who slash what should be considered a monster is potentially damaging, mm. but does the usefulness of monster, in quotes, remain even if people abuse it? I do believe monsters are still useful to us. We just need to be aware of how monstrosity is abused. It's all about consciousness. Monsters are a powerful force in storytelling. They reveal our fears to us. And if we know our fears, we become a little more powerful, if you ask me. I like to twist and play off traditional monster tropes myself. We're aware of many of the tropes of monstrosity, even if we haven't studied why they exist or even some of the harm that some of them have done. But it's nice to take that, question it, and change the way we think of monstrosity. I was chatting sort of jokingly with some colleagues uh, that we should definitely build a haunted house at UC Santa Cruz. We have games and theater together. This is a no brainer, but what are the monsters of Santa Cruz? You know, we have big, we have the Bigfoot Museum in Felton. We have a number of sort of cryptids that we might talk about in California, but what are our real monsters? 
can we make a room in a haunted house about rent prices? Probably. Uh, we all have different ways to think about uh, what is inarguable or, or determined to harm us. And some of them don't have traditional shapes. That's a really good question. Monsters, I think, are still a useful, dramatic tool. We just want to be really conscious and ethical about how we're using them and what shape they take. All right. Um, we actually have some questions here about D&D, &D, so I can't. I can't yes, help I love it. Um, I'm going to ask uh, two. They're kind of related. So Matthew asks, um, and I guess this is true. There, there have been many generations of rules for D&D. &D. Yes, in there have. Opinion, in your opinion, do these generations get better or is something lost along the way? And then Kelso, um, also I'd like you to elaborate on your perspective, experience and implementing values in your own uh, TTRPG to create an evocative game experience for your players. Um, Kelso is, is loving BG3 right now, by the way. But, <laughs> uh, let me know if you want me to repeat those, but uh, generations of rules for D&D &D and yeah. your own perspective. So I have been lucky enough to have played most versions of Dungeons and Dragons. For those of you who uh, aren't surrounded by this, I'll try to keep it brief. I still find it interesting and useful to play older versions of games, even if there are parts of them that I disagree with or dislike as a play style. Um, but I think it has to do with the consent at the table, the mood at the table. One of my most delightful playthroughs was a traditional vampire tale, Castle, Ra Castle Ravenloft fighting the vampire Strahd using second edition rules, which tend to be sort of brutally mathematical compared to the later editions, and also you're very likely to die. But because of the consent at the table, the, agree the agreement of the group was we would start as level zero characters, characters with almost nothing to speak for them in fighting a horrible vampire. But we would start with five characters apiece. They were giving, given lovingly names and backstories, but we all knew and agreed that they would perish uh, and that the ones that would survive might level up, uh, but that our numbers of characters would begin to diminish. We agreed that loss would be at the table uh, and we uh, were excited to be challenged by very difficult rules as underpowered characters. I will say that later editions of this game have made some big steps, not perfect steps, but big steps towards embracing a more diverse audience of players. Uh, tables have been more welcoming to people of color, to queer communities, to women, uh, than perhaps they were in the 70s and 80s. Um, still not a perfect community, but the rule books are starting to reflect the players a little better. And they're trying to go through and rethink some common fantasy tropes, tropes that assign values to different races uh, and abilities to different races, uh, tropes around disability uh, and about colonialism or what counts as a person and what counts as a monster. So I'm excited about the larger community of players in tabletop RPGs, thanks to the popular popularity of actual plays and newer editions of things like Dungeons and Dragons. But I still have a soft spot for something that's kind of intentionally obtuse, and I will engage with it for a little bit because it scratches a nice little mathy part of my brain. That was that question. Remind me of the other one. <laughs> um, I have to find it again. Did I dismiss those? Um, I think I should better move on. But let me That's see. okay. I think it was about uh, changes I make to games in my own tables. And I would say that I'm interested in systems that remember player actions and failing forward. Um, so I tend to hit players with narrative consequences rather than physical consequences. Whenever possible, I find them that they are more powerful uh, when also engaging in topics that reflect critical moments in our day-to-day -day lives. Short summary, we can talk more uh, if you come to another talk of mine or you're hanging out at the Festival of Monsters this weekend. <laughs> Hey, the next question is from Juan, and he starts with, hi, Elizabeth, amazing talk. And his question is, with designers infusing their values into the games they create, 
Do you think that they should try to communicate these values to potential players before they play? Or is it okay or even preferred to have players discover the designer's values through gameplay? It's an interesting question. Um, and I don't know if I have a clean answer for you. I think when we have a more educated audience, an audience that understands that games have a stronger perspective, we will treat that more like films and books. We assume a, an author has a perspective and a series of values and that those are going to sneak into their work. But we don't expect a novelist to tell us, hey, I'm this person, I believe in X, Y, and Z. And if you don't, screw you. Uh, or this is a book about subject Y from the perspective of X. Some good introductions will do that in nonfiction books. But in fiction books, um, we sort of discover the values of the author through their characters and their world. I'm okay with that discovery process as long as we're willing to treat games with the same level of criticism that we treat novels and films and plays. And I think we're very close to that. So I don't expect my designers to tell me their values. I expect designers to show them to me and I hope they're prepared for us to talk about them. Wow, fantastic. Um... Daniel, um, maybe this is something we haven't discussed. Can you comment on crowdsourced science games, especially the tension between scientific benefit and free labor? You know I'm not sure is. I'm aware of those games, but it sounds a little bit like um, uh, a game I remember back in the day called Fold It. Not knowing off the top of this, my head if those two things are related, I can at least talk about Fold It. Uh, which began as a way to give uh, some of your processing power on your computer uh, to the uh, to scientists trying to look at the many permutations of how proteins fold. But in addition to lending your computer to that endeavor, you could learn the game of Fold It, where you would follow the rules of protein folding in order to fold different configurations of proteins. What I really love about that learning game, uh, or at least an anecdote that was told to me back in the day, this is a little bit of an older game, was that they would then hold competitions between uh, lovers of the game of Fold It and scientists, and the lovers of the game of Fold It were better at folding proteins, a wild outcome. But there is some things to be said about the free labor aspect of a number of learning games. I think if people are consenting to it and understand how their labor can be used, there might be a citizen science sort of uh, valor to that kind of endeavor. But not knowing the games you're talking about specifically hard for me to comment specifically. Uh, I spend perhaps more time thinking about uh, user as product in free games uh, than I do about um, free labor and science games, but that gives me something to look more deeply into. So thank you for that. All right, the next question is from Stephanie. She starts with, thank you for the fascinating talk. Uh, I was interested in your observation about how gaming language and terms work differently in the research realm versus the mainstream slash player realm. Mm. Could you speak about what you'd like the average player to pay most attention to with respect to the concerns you've described as a researcher? Mm. That's a nice big question. I would say that for the most part, we share a language between players and designers and between players and researchers. I think the places where we get in the weeds a little bit is um, in some uses uh, in specific academic contexts. For example, um, the word aesthetics in the MDA framework doesn't refer to the visual presentation of a game, but is really talking about the experience of the game. So you might see a researcher, a game designer talking about the aesthetics of their game and not talking about the art at all. And that can create a little divide in the discourse sometimes between uh, designers and players, not an irreparable one, but just one, a little one. Or mechanics, for example, in deeper gaming circles than I, 
uh, has a very specific word usage in competitive gaming that has nothing to do with the verbs of a game at all. So even within gaming communities, some words that are commonly used have a more specific meaning in their context. I find it helpful to try to remind myself as an academic to define terms with every audience, especially if I don't know who's in the audience. So at least we're all speaking the same language. So if you find yourself in a discourse about games and you have people from different walks of life, uh, establishing terms to creating shared language really helps. Of course, I have a lot of practice as uh, a game player and game maker in a family that does neither of those things. I'm defining terms all the time. And uh, I suspect that's true for any hobbyist. Uh, so hobbyists have good practice at this. Okay, um, we have a question from Barbie going back to um, uh, maybe the the, uh, uh, the the monster program, right? Oh, and and a funny pun from Barbie. When it comes to scary to scary such as monsters, uh, quote evil or even glamorous intrigues like Barbies. Um, how do educators educate parents who may be hesitant to even engage in learning new values in educational game design? This may allow students more opportunities to excel in academics. It's a really good question. Since I mostly teach college students, parents don't often play into that equation, but I often make learning games for a younger audience. And the people I'm talking about often are, are teachers, um, teachers who are excited about interactive learning opportunities, but honestly are too overworked to spend time learn, learning a really complex game. They have the capacity in terms of, you know, maybe even experience with games, but buried in lesson plans and standardized texting, how can they make space for it? Um, this is slightly tangential to the question. I apologize about that. Um, but it reminds me of something I remember as, as, a, as a host and as a game designer, a host of exper two experiences in game designer is thinking about the needs of the audience as much as your needs of expression or the thing you're trying to teach. Uh, with that Fact Fuse game, the game on its reverse was a more complicated game. And we knew that learning the rules would be just a bear. And so instead of, or in addition to a traditional little rule book, we, compromised with ourselves. We wanted that sort of complexity or that unusual game form, um, but we wanted to make it easier. So we made a series of YouTube videos that guided the setup and the play of the game, a la the old VHS board games of the mid and early nineties, uh, a sort of announcer that would tell you at specific moments, stop whoever's turn it is, flip over your card, that sort of instruction. Thinking about taking weight off of uh, an introducer of a game uh, when they aren't necessarily the player of the game. I think uh, helping when parents over to games, uh, you have this interesting potential dissonance between the person gating the game, it's not the person playing it, it's not the audience for it. So how do you communicate to non-audience the value of a thing? <sighs> In California, we have a double-edged sword on this. Um, I'm going to make a fool of myself on a recorded content, but I believe this is still true. At least it was true five years ago. The game industry in California is a bigger industry than the film industry. We're a state that is a creative state. Um, it tends to be a little bit more leaning towards the uh, traditional blockbuster games that sometimes get a bad rap in media. But if for no other reason than it is a booming industry in California, sometimes you can get parents on board of the value of games. I hope we have a more nuanced conversation with parents about that because there are more nuanced and fun things to say about the values of learning how to make something like a game. But if nothing else, uh, we can be a little mercenary about it. Excellent. Uh, next question is from Nathan and he asks, why is it important to think about who the intended audience of a system is, mm. as well as who benefits from the system in separate lenses? That's really good. Uh, I think because of the moments when you realize that the intended audience isn't the one who benefits from the system. Um, thinking about uh, a commercial product, we might think of it as an interesting trade, 
uh, who benefits from us purchasing that uh, or the growth of an industry or reliance on TurboTax? Uh, <laughs> who benefits from the way our tax code is written in a way that's harder for a lay person to understand? Um, who designs it, who's it for, and who benefits, especially in the way our tax code is written, I think you'll find that those are three different people. <laughs> and by that, I mean three different groups of people. Uh, similarly, you might recognize it just as someone developing a taste for games on the more innocent side. Sometimes you might find a game that you really dislike, and that's because you might realize that you aren't the intended audience. And as a game designer, I often make myself play games outside of the genre or type or age group that is intended for me. But of course I have to play with a little bit of a lens of who that audience I'm supposing it to be, imagining what it might be for that audience as a way to try to study it. Um, it can be an interesting sort of distanced or sit in someone else's shoes sort of exercise. But I would say that uh, when we're talking about real world systems, who benefits and who the target audience is, unfortunately, isn't always the same. And uh, if we can find a way to narrow that gap in a few of our larger bureaucracies, we might all be a little happier. Okay. Um, I think uh, we're almost out of time. I think we'll, we'll just take one more question, uh, but a little housekeeping. Uh, Kathleen says, thank you for a great talk. I encourage everybody, post your messages in here, post your thanks, she'll, she'll get those later. Um, Lisa is wanting to know if the talk is being recorded. Recorded? Yes, it is being recorded, and we'll we'll post that. Uh, it'll be on these uh, again on the UCSC Arts and Lectures and Entertainment YouTube channel probably by tomorrow. Um, so keep your eye on that. Um, so uh, last question. I think this is a great way to wrap this up. It's a nice <laughs> big question. To you. What do you think is up and coming in game design and game application? Oh, so much. Um, I love to watch as industries grow up and it's over and oversimplifying to say this but especially with digital games thinking about it as a business not just all the amazing indie sort of electronic arts performers that i know and love but thinking about big business games it's not that old many people started when they were young in their life and now they're getting older they've had more life experiences and they actually want to tell stories about them you're going to find a lot of more stories about being an older mentor in games these days than you may have seen in the 80s. Um, and I like to think that that's a bunch of game designers having families now. And I think that's a fascinating thing to watch. On the more exciting side, I think, especially after the pandemic, we have a passion for experiences and we're learning how to harness them. I watched with interest as that Disney Star Wars hotel opened and then closed. I feel like they were close to something that people wanted, but didn't know how to capture it in a way that escape rooms are trying to capture it now. So I like to watch themed experiences and even one-time experiences and how we choose to value those, especially in physical space. And I'm, if there's a technology thing I'm geeking out about that isn't like tabletop RPGs or board games, which we can play just in the real world with people, I'm actually kind of interested in AR. I don't want to develop for it. And VR makes me motion sick. Sorry, VR developers. It's not for me. But adding a layer of fantasy and digital um, magic to the everyday, uh, at least in small doses, excites me quite a bit. Uh, I believe a link just went out uh, in the supporting the arts division and supporting performance play and design. Uh, we have a lot of projects. We deal in physical spaces as well as digital ones. Our student led production area, the barn. Some of you maybe went to a barn performance at UC Santa Cruz, student led production. Our barn got full of vermin and now also is earthquake unsafe. We wanna retrofit it real bad. Uh, so please support our students in the arts. We don't get, well, I won't say it, put it that way. Uh, finding donors in the arts can be more challenging than other fields at various institutions. Uh, our arts dean is doing a fantastic job, but there's so much work to be done. So uh, if you wanna offer mentorship to students, if you wanna post about internships at your company, uh, or if you wanna help us make our spaces more accessible, we'd really appreciate it. <laughs> 
no more roaches, rats, bird mites in the theaters, please. And I think we'll have to end it there. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's have, can we get a big round of applause for Professor Swenson? <laughs> Oh, the thank virtual you. clapping. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sharing your fascinating research with us this evening. If you would like to support her research, you can donate. Um, Diana just dropped a link in the chat box, as we just mentioned. Uh, another big round of thanks to the staff of the Alumni and Special Events Offices who organized this online forum. Thank you to Shana, Diana, Paulina, and Kristen. Also, do not miss the Festival of Monsters presented by the UCSC Center for Monster Studies, of which Professor Swenson is co-director. It is being held this Friday through Sunday, October 13th through 15th. It explores the ways monsters and tropes of monstrosity both preserve and conflict with forms of social and cultural injustice. You can see the full schedule of events at monsterstudies.ucsc. Edu. Then on Wednesday, November 1st at 5 p.m., both online and in person at the UCSC Silicon Valley campus, the Crawl Lecture Series of Science and Technology will feature Brandt Robertson, Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics, with a lecture titled Exploring the Most Distant Reaches of the Universe with the James Webb Space Telescope. And last but not least, our next Slugs and Steins event on Monday, November 13th will feature UCSC Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, Roxanne Beltran. She will discuss how her lab group explores predator-prey interactions in the open ocean by attaching electronic instruments to elephant seals and monitoring their survival and reproductive success. We hope to see you all there. On behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and please come back November 13th at 6.30 p.m. for our next virtual event. Thank you all.